Friends, welcome. Let me lay out what's happening here first. Number one, I am creating a new D&D &D campaign setting. Number two, it does not have a name yet. Number three, I am looking for input from the audience. If you wanna leave comments on YouTube, if you have something to say in chat, let me know. Number four, kind of have a good idea of what I'm going for right now. But the thing is, I'm actually, I hate drafts, I hate revisions. Everything that I do should be perfect the first time around. So be aware that what you see from me may be extremely childish and angry in the immediate future. So, you know, just just be aware. You may not be seeing me at my best. Something worst deserve. I don't know, third, fifth, sixth. Uh, I don't know where we're at. Tabletop audio will be playing in the background. I wanted to listen to some of the new tracks to know how they hear it before I put them on a show. I'm gonna try to keep it low. Hopefully, it will be beneath my voice. So we're going to be doing two parts to this unnamed setting. First is going to be the guide, which I'm going to show players when they get ready to get started. I anticipate this being fairly long and intensive because this setting is going to be high politics. It's going to have a whole bunch of stuff going on with it. Um, the other thing to consider is that I've never done a setting like this. So it may be increased in length due to that constraint the other other thing to note is that i'm basing it around all monstrous races so let's get started now that we have all of our constraints out of the way let me turn the music back on from tabletop audio this one's called tinker's workshop it definitely it feels to me like a gnome a halfling and a human got together to ruin the life of a dwarven blacksmith. So, let's start with the setting. This setting has four ages. The first age, first age is literally nothing. Second age is the age of dragons, also known as the Tyrantine age. The third age is where it starts to get a little political. This is the age where all of the pre, the dragons are gone now. We'll talk about that in a little while. Hopefully I'll get it in in this video. If not, I'm hoping to maybe do, no, no, the first age is not the age of creation. The first age is literally nothing. It's important to the concept of heaven and hell that the first age be nothing, and I will explain further down the line. The third age is the dragons are gone. They have controlled everything for all time. They're like the pharaohs. They're the god kings of the, the earth. Now that they're gone, the remaining races that the dragons have sheltered and more or less kept enslaved and bowed down, they need to figure out what they're doing with their life. So the third age is the age of race. This is where the remaining races shelter together. They build bonds of community based on what they look like and uh, worship rather than where the dragons tell them to live. So it's a, it's a time of great movement. It lasts a few thousand years. Until things start to break down, people start to come together and the fourth age is the current age which i don't have a name for yet my ideal with the setting is to have something like a world war one scenario and i don't mean it's going to be a world war what i mean is at the beginning of world war one you have this really interesting scenario in europe and also in several of the continents connected to it where there's this combination of people who are bound together by being of the same ethnicity 
and people who are bound together by the same religion, but also you start to get things get mixed up. Things start to break down and it gets really complicated. Co the colonial age is kind of ending at this point. There's a lot of movement going around. For instance, you can find Judaism almost everywhere, despite the fact that a ton of people hate the Jews. You can find it almost everywhere in Europe. They move around with little regard. Obviously, they don't have their own land yet. That doesn't happen until after World War II. I want to create this kind of complicated setup where uh, kingdoms that once were ruled by a certain race now are all mixed up. They've, you know, you've got like 15 different parts where Germany once was. Now there, it's it's like a reverse Prussia situation so you could conceivably get something like hey i want to reunite these kingdoms together under this one banner it's a little racist but you know historically that's been a pretty good drive for war by setting this in the fourth age we've got dragon ruins that the dragons built and then those ruins are underneath ruins of ancient kingdoms of the days long past the the times where the races did not live in harmony and they scattered themselves across the continents fleeing the persecution of the dragons and trying to set themselves up age of race ends now we've got kingdoms and nations and maybe a republic or two they're building ruins on top of the ruins on top of the ruins and so now there's plenty of places for adventurers to go there's there's you know dragon ruins that are for the most dangerous adventurers then you've got the the age of race ruins where you go to a specific you know type you know, these are the bugbear ruins, right? They're going to be very bugbear themed. They're going to be bugbear accessible. They're going to have things that bugbears would have, but you've also got several hundred years of the current age. So probably there's going to already be ruins of that time. Uh, I remember reading a story about someplace north of Persia. There was a kingdom in the middle of the desert. It was an empire. It, was, it had a huge, massive capital city. And at some point, trade broke down, and within 200 years, not only was the capital gone, no one could even remember anything about the empire. To this day, historians, we still don't know very much about it. I don't remember the name. Uh, they've, they've given it a name. It definitely existed, but it basically disappeared overnight historically because there was no one to carry on its stories. So in the fourth age, there will probably still be modern-ish ruins in the same way that in America, we could look back and be like, whoa, have you thought about the connotations that come from the word race to the origins of the British Raj? I haven't because I don't know what that means. Uh. Yes, I don't know what that means. I don't know that I have time to investigate it myself now. However, consider the following. In Dungeons and Dragons, there are very clear dividers of race. Because some people are definitely for bulgs, and some people are definitely not for bulgs. But as humans, we are all humans. There's just very little difference between us as humans. Sure, species. I could also buy that. When I say race, I am using the D&D specific terminology as presented in its contents. Chapter 2, Character Research, page 103, Volo's Guide to Monsters. So, even if I am using the word incorrectly, I think we all understand where I'm coming from. Alright, so I still don't have a name for the fourth age. Let's get started. The first page is going to be really simple. It is... First, there was nothing. This lasted forever and always. These are capitalized for very good reason. Forever and always is a part of heaven. And also never. 
also capitalized because it's a, it's a, a place. Never is also a place. So the heaven and hell in this particular setting is going to be in an intersection of times and places. So when I say place, forever and always isn't technically a place, it's a time. Time exists in heaven in the way that time does not exist in hell. And that's it. That's the entire first stage. Get to the second age. Then came the dragons. Bursting into existence, they brought with them and were made up of magic. They created greater planes of existence and brought about brought about life. All right, so now we've got dragons. We're not talking like one or two dragons. We're not talking like six to 10 dragons. We're talking hundreds to thousands of dragons suddenly appear out of nowhere. And now they're running the show. Still don't have a name for the world. Otherwise I would have called it the setting guide to that world. So they created the world unnamed. and populated it, bringing with them various peoples from the plains. I don't have players yet. I'm making the setting before I have players. I mean, the players who would play in a setting with this level of high politics are not gonna be your standard people. We're gonna be talking some premium level stuff. and even created new ones. All right, so now we've got a world, we've got people in it, the dragons rule it. The strongest dragon, the first dragon, set the tradition of all dragons, known as the tyrant. All right. <clears throat> so, the Tyrant is a dragon so strong, all other dragons recognize it. Even if they do not bow before it, they fear it. So, there's this thing in the setting where dragons instinctually recognize the strongest dragon. That doesn't mean no one can rise up against them. Dragons are immortal and they live forever. So, you kill it, you're the new tyrant. But, in, in order to become that tyrant, you have to be stronger than it, which means gathering followers, which means you need to find people with strong enough wills to resist the call of the tyrant. I don't know what Dragonlance is. That's a D and D setting, isn't it? I've never read it. All right, so now we've got the tyrant. I don't know the name of the first tyrant. First tyrant, unnamed tyrant, it was a black dragon of incredible power. It united all dragons. underneath their fierce banner. They came together to create the material plane. Playing with it. This was the early second age. Much knowledge this time has been lost as the dragons suppressed learning the races existed 
only to support their dragon overlords. Each dragon took what it wanted. Language. Writing. These things were outlawed and destroyed by the harshest measures. Even so, the dragons required intelligence servants. At this time, they had among them several peoples. All right, so now we're going to introduce the major races, species of the world. So um, I'm introducing Volos. So we got to have Azamar. And we'll write something for all these people later. Goliath, Kenku. Several of them I really want to focus on at some point. Tabaxi are going to be important right now. So let's do Tritons. Tabaxi and Dragonborn. Well, let's do Tabaxi now. The Tabaxi served as pets of the greatest dragons. <clears throat> Their quick minds and cleverness and cuteness made them most favored among all the servant races. All right, so in this setting, I'm just going to go ahead and copy paste some of this. So in this setting, most bard colleges are run by tabaxi because tabaxi end up being bards and heralds of the dragons. Once the dragons start allowing writing and uh, uh, language, which we'll get to in a minute, the tabaxi end up becoming like the, the premier overlord race one step slightly above all of the others in order to avoid being destroyed for being dragon traders and you know being on the dragon side once the dragons are all gone they end up becoming a sort of uh nationless historian race that wanders the world uh recording all things and telling entertaining tales of the past maybe not entertaining tales surely there's entertainment the dragons required intelligence. And so they crafted in their image, the dragonborn. Is there rules in Volo's guide to monsters for playing like gnolls and stuff as races? Because I, I really don't feel like this is enough races. I could have sworn that there were. I mean, I haven't read it that many. Giants. I don't see where they are. They're bad? I mean, I'm not saying just gnolls, right? But there should be, like, a bunch of races. And the thing you... I'm not seeing it. Yangshu. Gnoll tactics. But it's not telling me how to make a gnoll. It's just telling me about gnolls. Creating an old war band, goblins. Yeah, like I want to get more monster races. Guys, I understand that I could make these races. I just don't want to. That sounds like a lot of work for me. All right, you're saying it's on page 118 that works. Let's check that out. Oh. Monstrous character. Yeah, that'll do it. Oh, bugbear, goblin, hobgoblin. Let's add those in here. Bugbear, goblin, um, goblin, kobold. Orc. I'll keep out your own tea. I'm not into snakes. That ain't me. As some of you may know, snakes and sundares do not get along. Uh, it's a historical fact. 
All right, so the dragons have a problem. I realize I've spelled that wrong. It's actually dragonborn. All right, so dragons have this problem. Boom, we've got no servants that are particularly overly useful in like administration. So they create the dragonborn so that they have someone to talk to. are considered what we might see as talking dogs capable of being trained to speak and do minor tricks they are set to lead the increasingly large population of servant races all right so now this becomes an issue of language. So they have to invent a better language now. Dragons speak draconic in a way. Mortal races cannot comprehend. What we call draconic makes the correct noises but lacks the smell body language and magic embedded embedded in the tongue well dragons can understand such speech it aggravates them to hear such low voice. Maybe not low. Annoyance. So, now they have a problem. They teach the Dragonborn. They, well, first they invent the Dragonborn. And they're like, alright, you guys are in charge. Make sure these rabble work together and do what we want. So Dragonborn are like, great, we're going to teach everybody language so that when we tell them to do something, they understand it rather than just hand gestures. Second problem, most of these other races can't, well, actually, no one but the Dragonborn are capable of speaking Draconic. So they invented a new language, and the Dragonborn create common. A language of pure speech that all races are capable of saying using their mouths. That's a really weird sentence to have, but we do live in a setting where dragons speak with not just sound, but other things. So, and this is the Dragon Age, it's important that we sit aside. People need something other than dragons. It spreads among the people literacy and writing begin to take hold. This is commonly thought to be the first folly of the dragons. As the servant races begin to become more educated and efficient. They become more capable of resisting chronic influence. The most clever among them turn the Dragonborn against the most cruel dragons. Create situations where, with great sacrifice, the rest of Dragonkind turn against those marked by the wise. All right, so now we've got this thing where the servant peoples are being raised into these positions where they can communicate with dragons through the Dragonborn. I am starting with the lore. 
and the gameplay experience that I'm aiming for. I don't know. I want to do that lore. I want to do the lore thing. Isn't lore the most interesting part, really? I'm sorry. I don't have a reason other than it's interesting. And I can't get this stuff out of my head. I've kind of been bouncing it around for a little while. All right. So we have this, this thing where these races, they spent a few hundred, maybe a, a thousand years learning language, teaching each other, and the smartest and wisest and most clever of the races of these servant peoples are rising up and saying, hey, you know, it's tough out here living under Grattlebox, the insanely cruel, you know, and didn't he take some of your cattle last week? Didn't he insult you a hundred years ago? Didn't he this and that and the next thing? And so the Dragonborn are passing this along to the Draconic Masters and the dragons are going, yeah, man, that guy is like a huge dick. We should probably go deal with him. So they are starting to target the worst of dragon kind for elimination by their Draconic brothers. And it works. I mean, again, there's thousands of dragons and they have dragon children on a fairly regular basis. Now it takes a long time for dragons to mature, but they have had tens of thousands of years to do it at this point so while they might be not be the most numerous race they're dragons and they can destroy a whole town overnight not a huge problem for them to deal with you know a couple couple servant peoples they don't really consider the rest of the races a threat and so when they get these minor requests to help deal with people who are making lives worse for everyone they do it and so we come to the end of the early age of dragons and begin the descent into the last age of dragons. With it comes the rise of the last tyrant, the gold dragon unnamed dragon savior. At the rise of his rule, a great object fell from the sky to mark his coronation, smoting his own father and ending truly tyrannical rule. The last tyrant considered this object. Sometimes. And many now postulate among learned circles what exactly it was that turned him to madness. But in time, he began to turn dragons against one another. Eliminating many of the chromatics who were a great threat to the world. Once all those who could resist his call as tyrant were eliminated, he rose up to the heavens, the world above, called all dragons forth with him. Each dragon rose into the air, unable to resist, and became the stars in our sky. And that's the end of dragons, or is it? The only remaining dragons were those still lay in their eggs. The survivors of those hatchlings are the few dragons who still 
exist today without the lore and learnings of their parents they were but babes in a world without order now many were called by those who were upset with the way things were still some people's protected eggs and carried them back to their people. It is for these great sacrifices that some cities bear the protection of a sovereign dragon. Though their numbers are reduced by one in 100, and again, dragons still remain a powerful force in the world. However, there is no order. The entire system of language and governance has fallen apart without the dragons to rule. It becomes an age of chaos that lasts for a time before history. Not a new page yet, it's hard to see. Thus begins the age of races. In the aftermath of the Great Rising, the different servants of the dragons came together as one people and set themselves out to tame new lands. Each race took upon itself a place favorable to its own preferences. For an unbroken time, there was peace. Surely, there was hardship and sacrifice. Civilization grew in solitude. Well, Red, you should know that the lizard folk are a race and they do live on the beaches. And they're a very interesting race in this setting. I haven't written it down yet, but they are uh communal based more than many other races certainly more than humans they revere the strength of the community over any one person's contributions and so in order to refer to yourself in a singular i like call yourself i you must earn such right by doing great service to the community otherwise you simply refer to yourself in a sort of ambiguous third person uh, which is difficult to translate outside of the lizard folk language. Um, and so they're known for being like very honorable. They place um, people who work hard at any different task at the highest level. So rather than being like, yes, the strongest person is the best, they say, ah, yes, the best builder, you know, the best weaver, these are the people that you must aspire to. So that's it's lizard folk specific in this setting each of these little races is going to get their quirk all right so now we've got all these races out here they are they are expelling themselves from each other they don't know how to live with each other they share a language of common but other than that they look different from each other they've never really gotten along they've worked together to try to trick the dragons the dragons end up tricking themselves 
portrayed out of existence. So now each of these races has gathered up a dragon, egg, several dragon eggs perhaps, and they've all divided themselves. They're saying, I'm going here. I'm okay, we're gonna go here. This place is, works for us. You know, if you, if you like the forest, we also like a forest. You could take that forest, we'll take this forest. There's no reason for these people to fight among themselves. For the first time, they have freedom. So they don't, for now, for now. So they all split up and go Shoo. All right, there's a question in chat. Any chance you'd mind if I ask, how the heck do I story hook this question? I've run into a robot with party motivation. If they choose an alternate path and I'm trying to figure out how to allow the progress if they make that decision. All right, we'll approach that question. You'll need to send more information because I don't really know, like I don't have enough context to answer that, I think. Certainly chat can provide some answers. I'm gonna keep thinking on what I've got here, but as soon as I got context, I'll give you an answer. So all these people split off and they form their own civilizations and they rise up at different rates, of course. You know, no, no one place is outstripping any other in like every category, but you know how it is. Athens is the nation of peace and Sparta is the nation of war, that kind of thing. They're, they're, generalizations that don't hold up over time but they're things that people believe each of the races becomes a personification of a different virtue that is personable to them and the land that they chose to live in then came more with all things Greed was the beginning. As education, farming, and agriculture, and animal husbandry spread from each place to place, small bits of information pass quickly. Each land suddenly bloomed with food, meaning more people could be sustained. There were no thinkers or such forward problems like city expansion and the rise of nations. These arts and philosophy beside... I spelled that totally wrong. Are built on a foundation of knowledge and experience these first people Do not judge them too harshly. As each race expanded, more and more land would be needed and used. So the first borders came to be, and there was not peace. Resources necessary for each race were not unique. At first, it was simple skirmishes and insults. But in time, the threat to one colony became a threat to an entire race's existence. So war broke out. Now I gotta know which two races in the settings are the ones that are gonna fight first. So I guess we need to ask which two races are probably going to expand the fastest. 
I mean, for my money, I'm like Goblin right there with their short lifespans comparative to other races require a very fast expansion. Orcs and elves, orcs exist, elves don't. Elves are not monstery. Uh, so let me add this. I haven't talked about it yet. The continents that this takes place on are kind of set aside in the world. They're not the only places in the world, but they are the only ones that know about each other. At the very start of the setting, the traditional D&D 5e races from the, the core book, minus, of course, Dragonborn, show up and are like, hey, we're, we're a united alliance of like elves and dwarves, and we got these cool things called humans that don't really have any special, special capabilities, unlike the rest of us. And we come from, you know, over here. And we were sailing for a really long time. Wow, goblins are less intelligent than hobgoblins. Look at these goblin racists out here. Everyone shame the goblin racist. You're actually right though. Hobgoblins get an intelligence score boost. I, I mean, it's not about intelligence. It's about the rate of maturation. Um, how do I say this? I mean, I'm, I'm basically having to distill the entirety of the book, Gun, Germs, and Steel, into a couple sentences. The amount of food and the speed at which you are brought to being an adult raise the rate at which you historically have children. Look at the birth rates historically versus the birth rates now and uh, races that have, uh, not races, I'm sorry. I'm thinking in D&D &D terms, but I'm thinking, I should be thinking in real life. Um, humans now have much lower birth rates than in the past for several circumstances but hugest among them is that there's plenty of food, but a very long maturation cycle. We don't consider people adults until very late in their lives compared to earlier peoples. And so, I don't know where I'm going with that. Anyway, you're saying kobolds mature in one year? Is that right? Kobolds reach adulthood at age six. Ah, that is right, but they live super long. They can live up to 120 years, but they rarely do so. Wow. All right, I'll buy that. A kobold goblin war would be pretty interesting. Kaldaka Gray, the answer to your, your problem is not something you need to, you as a game master do not need to address it in game. That is a problem that your players need to address out of character. All right, so your problem is, is that if the players don't want to play, they can just have their characters retire and not continue. That is not something you can solve as a game master, except in very like railroady hammery ways. The way you solve it is by going to the players and saying, hey guys, this is how we get back on the rails. You just tell them, you just say, hey, if we want to continue doing this, you're going to have to go down this path. That's perfectly fine. I know it might sound weird, but it'll work out. You, you don't need to give them a reason. You need them to tell you their reason. If they decide to be fugitives, you want to clear their name? There's a lot of talk about this. I'm gonna let chat handle this one for a moment. Where was I? All right, so swore. War broke out. The goblin people and the kobold people shared similar environments. <clears throat> Indeed, kobolds had long coveted 
mountains of the goblins where the most dragon eggs had lain and where many dragons made their nests. Drawn instinctively, in, that's spelled wrong, instinctively. I think it's still spelled wrong, but all right. Drawn instinctively to serve dragons, the kobolds entered goblin territory without restraint. Goblins answered in the crude way of violence and the horror of it all shook the continents. The news had reached the farthest reaches after peace had been negotiated. But alarm rose up. Now, safety. Each race, uh, it should be the safety. The safety of each race against the others was a dire concern. Cities, walls, garrisons, towers, all rose in unthinkable time. Borders were created and protected. The first steps towards standing armies had begun. And it is in this moment that the gods came. All right, so now we need to talk about gods. I'm gonna need to list all the domains in the setting. But the most important one is the god of light and that domain is ruled over by the grand cock. I am making that its name because it's funny, but also because I have never had a non-humanoid god in a setting before. So this god, the Grand Cock, is literally a chicken. It's a chicken, and it's said that when this chicken crows, it drives off undead and things in the night, which is exactly how the light domain works. Chickens are considered a divine animal by everyone. The Grand Cock isn't capable of communicating with other gods and doesn't care to do so. It doesn't join any pantheons. It has the most followers in the world because its message is very simple. It's, it's a god that watches over farming. It's a god of fire. Um, these are all very popular things. Lizardfolk Paladin of the Grand Cock of Retribution. Okay. Well, Radosaurus has chosen his path wisely. All right, so the Grand Cock uh, is the Platinum Chicken. Platinum coins are almost always minted in its honor. You know, with one side is the nation that minted it, and the other side is the Grand Cock. It, again, it doesn't communicate with other gods. It has the most followers, but the smallest priesthood because it expects people to do what it wants to. All right, so it reminds me that I forgot to say something about race. Not race, religion, religion. And that is heaven and hell. All right, so heaven and hell in this place, heaven is the intersection of always and forever and everything. So this is not understood by the peoples in the world, but this is the lore and this is how I'm running it. So if you serve good gods or you do things that the good gods like, when you die, your soul goes to always and forever and everything, which is known to us as heaven. And it is, it is set forever. It is infinity. So when you arrive, you've just arrived. Everyone else throughout all time who have died 
also arrive at the same time as you. It is outside the comprehension of everyone. Your grandfather and your grandchild all arrive in heaven at the same time as you. And it lasts forever. It lasts infinitely. So it's a great time in heaven. Hell is never and nothing. When you go, when you die, and if you've been a bad person, if you make deals with demons and devils, uh, if you serve the dark powers, you're basically tormented for never. It's cold, nothing happens, ever. It's basically just, like, nothing. Forever. But it never happens. So it's the opposite of heaven. So it's bad. Now! You might be asking, what happens if you don't serve good or evil? Neutrality equals unrested spirit. You are either put to rest by a cleric of one of the faiths. So basically, a cleric goes, all right, sounds like you lived a good life. Even if you didn't, even if the gods didn't judge you, I'm sending you to heaven. Or you become an undead. All right, so there's a pretty good reason for people to generally avoid neutrality, and that gives us a good reason to have religious conflict, and also to have like demons and angels and stuff show up and be like, ah, I'm the great angel. Undead playable race? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Undead playable race. You know, I was going to have a nation of undead in a way that Pathfinder does. I forget what it's called. The nation of Pathfinders undead. Some smart person in chat will let me know what it's called. But the Whispering Tyrant came from there, and I really like the idea of the Whispering Tyrant, so I'm gonna essentially steal it. Um, that this super powerful Lich Lord attracts other undead to it, and undead travel across the world to join the undead. Maybe he's called the whispering tyrant and um because he like whispers like you know you know like in sea of thieves when you get near a skull you hear like weird whispers i think that's how the whispering tyrant works um asmr tyrant please no i hate asmr it's so fucking weird i get that it's for some people but for me it just sounds like audio garbage it's like listening to k-pop sorry k-pop stands it was a cheap joke, it's too easy to let go. Couldn't be he be a patron? Perhaps, perhaps. So I'm not saying, I'm not gonna copy the Whispering Tyrant specifically, but there will be a place where the undead congregate around increasingly powerful undead lords. Because the way undead works, one powerful necromancer can control an infinite number of undead and a powerful necromancer can also take control of a powerful undead that controls other undead so you end up having naturally in the way that sorting algorithms work at some point the steady state of the undead world would be that one powerful person ends up controlling a bunch of powerful undead that control other undead and so they would probably gather in one place do I have text-to-speech donations? No, I don't. I don't like them. I think people abuse text-to-speech donations to make it say weird things. Annoying things. Alright, so I need to get the other domains, and I'm probably going to have to go to D&D Beyond in order to do that. Now I'm almost certainly not going to use all domains, but I'll probably use the domains that are from core books and then maybe a couple of other cool ones cleric all right trickery sounds normal mains so i'm gonna need to sort these domains and their gods into different pantheons arcana death is always evil Forge, grave. Well, grave domain is some real bullshit. Life, light. We already have light. I just deleted our life. 
Uh, nature order. I don't know. Is that from the base book? Trickery war. What is it order from? Ah, it's from Ravnica. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and remove that. Ravnica is uh, that one setting I haven't quite read yet. Eberron? No, Ravnica's the D and D or the Magic the Gathering setting. There we go. I got there. Calm down if you were typing in chat to tell me how wrong I was. I got there eventually. All right, so I need a gods for each of these things, and I need to assemble at least two pantheons that will not like each other. All right. Hmm. The death domain. God, it sucks the death domain is uh, inherently evil. Do some cool stuff. Maybe I might just throw that out. Hmm. Maybe I won't. Maybe I'll make death like light its own thing. All right, we need to make a death god. Their job is to rule over hell. Judge the unworthy. So they're, they're second fiddle. So death is, if someone dies, heaven judges them, boom. If heaven judges them and says, no, we don't want them. Death judges them and says, okay, we do or don't want them. And if heaven and death or if, if you know heaven and death both say no then you get reincarnated as an undead or whatever you become an unrested spirit it's gleemo all right so what domains work well together trickery is alcohol i associate that with dwarves knowledge life all right maybe let's sort them out by things which work well together things which hmm I think Tempest is supposed to be the portfolio of judgment it makes it weird that there's all oh we removed order so never mind I don't need to care about that all right so Tempest is judgment and I feel like Tempest and nature are somewhat in opposition they draw from the same power, but they have opposing ideals. Nature is very chaotic. It's about the natural world, whereas Tempest is about order and judgment. That's why it's associated with people like Zeus and the Indian version of Zeus, which is Indra. That's real India. And in fact, he existed before Zeus, I believe. More like Zeus is the Viking version of Indra. Anyway, Indra is a cool dude. I only associate Tricker with blue tieflings. Wow. Jester, Levor, the ruby of the sea. <laughs> All right. Let's say to some extent that war, tempest, trickery. No, trickery is chaotic. It's totally shitty. Uh, forge and knowledge all go on one side life divine arcana why are people just saying kitsune so confused right now what am I missing uh the Kana. Mine some for some reason isn't in here. Life. We need nature. Trickery. Tempest. Nature. Grave. Trickery is not on the lawful side. It's on the chaos side. 
I was gonna put it on the lawful side. Then I decided not to. I mean, Tempest is about... I know Tempests are traditionally... Uh, kind of chaotic swirls of death, but Tempest is, is about judgment and justice. You're trying to make a class that focuses on out-of-battle utility. What kind of skills should you use? The answer to that is, they should be a wizard, because that's what a wizard is. Boom! Got him. Could also be a bard. <laughs> Seriously though, wizard is... I mean, they, they used to call them Batman wizards, because they were literally nothing but utility spells. No matter what happened, they would always know have something exactly. Right, Will of the Storm? I don't know what Will of the Storm is. Do I have all of them now? Let's go through the list. We have got Arcana. Death. Forge. Grave. Knowledge. Life. Light. Nature. Uh, we're skipping order, so Tempest. Victory. And I miss Divine. And War. Alright, so we got them all. Untap our mana here. I don't know if I care that much about it, but it might be worth considering. I mean, it, you say Tempest is classically a storm god, and I don't disagree with you, but the examples given for Tempest Obeying include Kord, who has nothing to do with storms, uh, and say fire gods, gods of earthquakes, gods of violence, physical strength, and courage. In some pantheons, a god of this domain rules over other deities and is known for swift justice delivered by thunderbolts. In pantheons of seafaring people, these gods are ocean deities. So, yeah, I mean, the... I think it is a problem... Uh, of language, because calling it Tempest is weird, and it's associated with storms. I mean, given the all of its abilities are storm-based, specifically thunder and lightning. Uh, and not like fire and earthquakes, but maybe this is a new take on it. You say that Tempest domain gods have been neutral or chaotic. Well, let's look at gods of the multiverse and see what we got here. 
Tempest, evil, chaotic evil, chaotic evil, neutral, chaotic, neutral, chaotic, 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 lawful. Oh, that's Celtic. Uh, Maclear. Man and Maclear. Zeus. I mean, you're right that a huge number of them are. Sobek, the crocodile god of Egypt, is lawful. It's not impossible. There's at least two to three examples of it. Did this go all the way back around to Tinker's Workshop? I guess I need to... I really reach the end of it all? Huh. I, know, I guess I didn't realize it was already nine o'clock. Tell you what, we'll put Tempest aside for now and we'll deal with them later. Astro plane. Alright, so let's remove that. And we've got some more songs. Okay. So we've got two pantheons now. I don't I don't really feel like I need to fill in all these gods. Now, or really ever. Um, obviously the Grand Cock is going to be a huge part of the setting, given that they're the anti and death god, and that they have the largest religion, but we have gods of law, and gods of chaos. And then we have two deciders who choose what to do with your fate after you die. The Grand Cock judges people whether they have been good. And if you die, then the unnamed death god says, well, you've been bad. And if neither of those happen, your spirit just goes unrested on the earth to wander as like a ghost or like a ghoul or a zombie or something, or something that people could turn into an undead. And that clerics will need to then consecrate or desecrate in some form, saying, hey, I'm a priest of good people. It sounds like your life has been pretty good. I'm sending you to the good people place. I'm sending you to the good place. The music's not actually playing, huh? Problem solved. Solutions found. All right, I still need a name for the death god and any idea what the death god is like. So the thing about death in this place is that death is really, really super bad. It's essentially the gateway to eternal torment, like evil death, right? The God of Death isn't specifically about death, but dying. Did anyone, uh, no, it's not going to be Ryuk, please no. Did anyone figure out if there was an undead playable race somewhere in D&D? Like an official one that I don't need a homebrew in some way that'll annoy me really badly. Nope, the name of the Death God will also not be Justin Bieber. Not gonna be Kevin either, and I think you know why. <laughs> Monsters, racist, here we go. Orcs of Exandria, nope. That's from Alexandria, Leonids, Satyrs. Nope, that's from the other thing. I'm not gonna include Ganassi at this time because they're planar related. Feral Tiefling, no. Oh, but adding Tiefling into the mix might not be a bad idea. Kalashtar. Oh, it's Eberon. Never, Eberon, never mind. Uh, Warforge. Mm, I don't know. I would. I think Warforge would be interesting as a new race, like something that was recently invented by inventors. 
You're saying awakens undead and soul stitched. I have n I don't see them on D and D Beyond either of those. Soul Stitch D and D five E race. Booker in the end. <laughs> it's homebrew. They're homebrew. Never mind. So I guess I'll have to make something myself. Okay. I imagine that the grand cock is kind of strutting about eating any soul that it enjoys adding its to its being. I don't think that that's super unusual way to look at it. The grand cock is not able to be understood by human minds, by humanoid minds. It is, you know, it's a god to start with. So already it can't be understood, but even among other gods it's considered unusual. All right, I have a bunch of discord messages. Let me check those real quick. Make sure nobody's like, hey, everything's on fire. <laughs> Gothic characters. I don't know what that means. Let's check it out. Unearthed Arcana Gothic characters. Oh, I don't know about that. All right, let's take a look. I already don't like it. The whole first paragraph is terrible. <laughs> Thirst for revenge against those who have wronged you. Nothing like vengeance to make a great player character who's going to be super annoying and edgy. Racial adjustments. By choosing a sub-race, I mean, that's going to be part of the problem. Your constitution score increases by one. That's it. If you're below half your hit point maximum at the start of your turn, you regain one hit point. When your goal is completed, you die. That's it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine going on an adventure and having to be like, all right, guys, I know the guy that killed me. Let's just go. Let's go and kill him. And like you're, you're halfway through the campaign. You finally get your party to go kill that guy. And then you just disappear. And everyone's like, oh, my God, where did he go? And you're like, I'm at rest now. Now I can go to heaven. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, this is a uh, McComicer character for sure. This is the most McComicer character I've ever heard about. All right, well, it was very interesting, Red, and it has convinced me that I need to make my own sub race. That's all there is to it. Uh, check out this first page for society building. Build custom settings. All right, Rad's linking me all sorts of stuff. Civil environmental factors. All right. Well, this is definitely going to be useful later. Not now, but it's going to be useful for the fourth age for sure. So let me get that into my D&D folder. G's 5e planning templates 2017 underscore society builder. Request access from Radosaurus. Okay, done that, done that. All right, are we ready to get back to stuff? So I don't have a name for the death god. I don't have their personality. It's definitely not going to be Kevin or Ryuk. Let's get back to doing some setting stuff. 
In the absence of dragons, religion and faith became a unifying factor bringing race nations together. Divisions between faith began late in the third age. Began, well, I should say began in the late third age. <clears throat> Led to another exodus of the people. As gods sent their followers to create new lands where all those of their faith could explore and develop. All right, so now we're ready for the fourth age. Thus begins the fourth age, currently unnamed. I, I don't know that we're gonna get much farther than this tonight. Uh, I'd wanted to get like an hour in. We're already way past that. We're almost like an hour and a half. So we have the base for an interesting world filled with a lot of old stuff. You've got dragon stuff, like ancient dragon magical items, ancient dragon, you know, things, ruins. You've got third age so like when all the kobolds lived in the kobold kingdom together now that kingdom is long gone but its lands are still inhabited by kobolds but also other races now and the ruins there are all kobold based probably they're like shrines to dragons and stuff and now we've got the current age so where once there were not that many races or, I'm sorry, where there, where there were not that many nations. There was only one for each race. Now there are many nations vying for the same places. And so I definitely want to have several interesting locations like a desert. I absolutely want to have a desert kingdom split in two, vying for hierarchy. So like a civil war in a desert where people are fighting over it. Is there archaeology? Is there archaeology? I'm, gonna, I'm just going to type that. Is there archaeology? Is there ever? It's going to be nothing but archaeology. Gathering up the ancient treasures of the past, great magical items of dragons and those inherited by the wisest. So if you'll recall, there were some very wise people during the second age, the age of dragons, who basically tricked the dragons into fighting each other. Those people made some of the first magical items, like scrolls. So dragons made dragon magical items, but these are the people that invented alchemy, potions. They invented scrolls because writing is a thing now. So the the heritage of those things traces back to ancient ruins and people are interested in going and gathering up old draconic things and now they're at a time and a place where sending people to get those things is is capable you know in the old days you were just worried about surviving long enough but now you can form universities and bard colleges and you can create fit groups of people so i don't want to say adventurers guild but i definitely also want to have an undead land where they congregate surrounded by fortress cities of the grand cock so that lets us have cool paladin adventures and like knights and stuff like that uh i want to have Something like our theory, something like the legacy Arthurian round table. All right, so here's my idea for this place. It's a small nation. It's, it's it's formed. It's not religious. 
it's not atheist, but it doesn't answer to any one god, and it has a very good military discipline. They're basically formed from like a, a former mercenary company. They, they get the idea that maybe might doesn't make right and that they should try to enforce peace and justice in their in the land that they live in and basically end up ruling that land and they create this sort of society where you know all knights are of an equal rank e even the ruler of the land is of a rank equal and must listen to the knights that that serve this kingdom so now it starts to attract people from other nations for a specific reason. Because it's a nation of knights, that means that if you are from another country, you can still end up becoming someone who is a ruler, like essentially a noble, as long as you're a knight, or as long as you're a soldier who's strong enough to become a knight. And so this nation has become the sort of Camelotian justifier of peace. And from it springs a sort of philosophy of pure justice and judgment. Probably they're gonna get a, like a little bit of that Tempest God. Cause you know, I'm, I'm big on Tempest being about judgment. Maybe not though. Maybe it'll be the God of knowledge. Maybe there won't be a God at all. Either way, the point is this place starts a sort of Arthurian romance era of sending its knights on quests in order to solve problems in other nations by declaring them ambassadors so that they can't be interfered with in the usual way. And so they become not just wandering uh, like knight warriors, they also become a sort of uh, wandering lawyers who will take on cases in whatever nation that they are ambassadorialing in that people think are otherwise hopeless and fight for what they believe is justice. So they'll take on the cases of people who uh, believe they aren't being listened to, who believe they say, I'm innocent, can't you help me? They will plea to these people. And so even though this country that they come from is not very big, it's not very strong, it's got a very tight military core, and from that rises a sort of renaissance of forward thinking and progressivism that sort of spreads throughout the world. So I, I absolutely want to have a country like that because, you know, I'm really, 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 really big on Arthurian legend. Really big. Also, my name is Arthur, so... Now, I don't want to have adventuring guilds like traditional uh, video game adventuring guilds where, or the, you know, everybody gets together in a tavern. I've done that a lot lately, but I do want to, I know we've called these monstrous races. I want to have a traditional monster nation. And I'm talking like aberrations, uh, owl bears. Basically a shithole area. No people live there. It's just overrun with monsters and it is surrounded on three sides By monster hunting cities And this is basically like hardcore adventuring right here So uh, if you really want to kill monsters, this is where you go. And each of these cities is going to be very different in their methodologies. They pay you to go out and kill these monsters. Well, it's more like they offer you a job to go out and kill the monsters. You kill the monsters, you bring back the monsters so it can be harvested. Or, you know, like magical blood from the monster that can be turned into health potions. Harvesting monsters is really big there. So it's, it's like a... Monopoly guild that has risen up, but each of the each of these hunting societies in each city, each of the three cities is very different, uh, and that's like considered hard mode adventuring. It's certainly not the only thing for people to do because exploring ruins 
is the currently big in thing. And as I mentioned earlier, humans and the traditional D&D PHB races have been discovered at a far off land. And so people are preparing an expedition to go out to there. So that allows for another thing in the setting for people to go do. I just want to leave a lot of things for players to be able to do. And the other thing I want to make sure that is clear here is that borrowing from Pathfinder, each country will be a kind of genre. So if you're a big fan of Galarian, you understand that each country was invented in a source book and that source book had a genre associated with it. Uh, Taldor, which you might know of nowadays is Taldore, which is the world of uh, Matt Mercer's Critical Role. Taldor is based on Taldor, which is from Pathfinder, which is a sort of faux French upper class British empire that's it's like rising back out of decline. Kadira is like the Far East adventures, like like near, sorry, Near East adventures. It's a whole side of the planet that's got different like Wuxia adventures as part of it. There's the, the horror country, and then there's the barbarian country. There's the dinosaurs of real country. There's the demons country. There's the ancient empire country. There's the Egypt country. So each one is its own genre of adventures, and I want to have something similar to that. So if and when I get to making a second uh, video for this, when we do a second session of this, time permitting, we're going to start making countries and each country will have some sort of genre or primary adventure associated with it. Radosaurus is apparently giving me homework in Resolve. Uh, I don't know why I said in Resolve, uh, but something along the lines of the United States Marines uh, attempting to build societies. So I guess I'll have to take a look at that and create a uh, apparently like a 25 part. No, it's a six by five column. So 30 part structure for each society. It feels like it's gonna get really in depth, but we'll see how it goes. I don't know that there's any fur anything further. I'll, I'll stick around here for a couple more minutes to answer any questions people have at the last second. And then I'm probably gonna switch over and play Sea of Thieves. Is there any final questions for this unnamed setting? Maybe someone has an idea for a name. I'm missing a lot of names. But I don't just want to be like, the name of this planet is Earth. And the name of the continent is Continent. The name of the god of death is Death God. You know, it's tough coming up with a name where someone's like, oh, wow, that's a good name for a bad dude. You know, I work hard to name my characters. Not, you know, not not like my NPCs, but my actual characters. Dante Fierro, that name took a lot of work. Count Ronald of the House of Swan, that name took a lot of work. Listen, if you're gonna make the son of Swan, Swanson. Names require marinating? Ooh. <laughs> I hate the way you said that. <laughs> Mmm, marinated name, my favorite. If the main god is a chicken, I mean, listen, don't be distracted by the main god being a chicken. It's not gonna be farm themed. <clears throat> the main god being a chicken is because it's funny and I stole it from the manga. I will answer one more question, whatever comes next. We'll see what happens. Then we're going to see thieves. So y'all better be ready. After a short break, I'll probably have to see if Rad and Gleam are into Sea of Thieving. Maybe they're already Sea of Thieving. Who knows? I guess I should ask them. Well, Gleemo says Yar in chat, so probably he's going to be in a Sea of Thieves. He says he's thieving now. Well, stop thieving. All right, there haven't been any other questions. We're going to go on a pretty short break here. When we come back... I'll be see you thieves time. Thanks for joining me. And uh, stick around if you want to watch me get owned.